So thank you everyone for joining me. Good morning. Today we're going to talk about how we debug our applications using OpenTelemetry. Uh, why am I here talking about this? My name's uh, Josh Lee. I'm a developer advocate for Instana. Instana is an observability platform. So one of the things that I do often is help our customers with their OpenTelemetry implementations. Um, so one of the words that you definitely have been hearing a lot about is observability. And ooh, this is going to get cut off. That's going to be fun. So that says, how do we debug our applications, which is really the one thing that I really want you to think about while I'm talking about this today. Uh, this is Grace Hopper's computer, right, with the, the vacuum tubes and the, the bug that was uh, actually a bug. But um, the real answer to how we debug our applications today, right, is um, maybe this. No? OK. So this is a joke, but this is actually not how we debug our applications. This is the last step. This is the easiest step for most of us, right? Like, we're experts in our programming languages, in our tools. Usually, when there's a bug, the, the actual cause of the bug is painfully obnoxi obnoxiously simple. It's a typo. It's a misspelled variable. It's a logic error. It's actually finding that bug, right? That's, the, that's the, where the actual challenge is. That's where the actual work is, is getting to the point of knowing what we actually need to Google getting our mean time to Google lower um, so that we can actually fix the problem. Now, in production today, for me, that usually means just doing a lot and a lot of reading and comparing and contrasting. It's almost like playing that, that children's game that we all remember, the puzzle, where you have to spot the differences and you're just looking at one monitor, looking at another monitor, trying to compare and contrast, trying to correlate log messages and trying to piece together the puzzle of what's actually happening inside your system. And that gets old fast, so eventually we go, okay, this is ridiculous. We can't do with just logs. We need more than this. And so we throw some metrics onto our services, and we get some pretty dashboards with some pretty icons and alerts. And these are great, right? This is taking a, a, a wealth of information and condensing it into a digestible format. But it's not perfect, right? This still requires us to have some expert understanding, some expert knowledge of what these icons and alerts mean. This still uh, doesn't actually show us the full picture, right? We have no ability to drill down into the metrics that make up these pretty charts and find the, the real information that's informing these aggregates. And it's also not that scalable, because if you just put a dashboard on everything, eventually you end up with, well, something that looks like this. Um, so we need a better way. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So just. Real quick, it's kind of dark in here, and I apologize, but just raise your hand if you're already using distributed tracing in your debugging lifecycle. OK, so for those of you raising your hands, you already know how awesome it is. I need to tell everyone else, and uh, that's what I'm going to do right now. So distributed tracing right, is, is a system of, oh, that's really hard to see. That's unfortunate. Oh, well. So distributed tracing follows request flows through our system, right? We can imagine each one of these nodes as a different service. And if we could see this better, we would see the lines going between the services. And we would see that this one over here has a little red circle on it. That one has a red circle on it, right? We need something that jumps out at us like this. We need a map that tells us exactly where the error is. So here's hopefully a slightly better view of what a distributed trace actually looks like. Maybe we can fix this. No. OK. Um, so a trace is really just a collection of spans. A span is some work that happens inside a service that's interesting to us as a developer. Um, and each time that service then calls another downstream service, whether it's a message queue, a database, another microservice, right? we get another span. And we get this, this almost waterfall view, looks like Chrome developer tools, right, of the request flow. So this is great. This is really useful, right, if you're trying to do some, some performance analysis and figure out where the latency is in your system. We can immediately see the value in this visualization. We can also immediately see how errors would sort of flow up to the top. So if we have an error in one of these downstream services, we can immediately identify where that error is. Um, and I think there's, there's more to this than we maybe initially understand from its simplicity. This is so much of the work that happens in debugging an incident response, right, is getting to this point of knowing which services were involved, which customer requests caused the issue, and, and then where do we go from here to fix it. 
So, okay, how does tracing fit in? Right, traces, uh, so what this says, right? I, I just wanted to really briefly review the fundamental characteristics of our telemetry signals. Traces are request scoped, right? They follow a user request through the entire system. That's the, they're really their defining characteristic. Um, metrics are aggregable. We can do math with them. That's really nice. And logs are just a timestamped record of events. They're very verbose. They let us put in as much information as we want, and we can grep and search for that later. Um, uh, one thing I do want to point out, observability, right, is not signals. This might look like the three pillars. I'm talking about this because it's going to become relevant when we're talking about open telemetry, not because this is what observability is. I don't know if Charity Majors is here yet, but if you want to read more about that, her blog is excellent. So, okay, we have our three signals that open telemetry currently supports, metrics, traces, and logs. Metrics are great for answering the question, is there a problem, right? They give us alerts, they tell us there's smoke. When we see smoke, we, we know there's fire, and we can dive in and start investigating. Logs are great. Once we have the right log message, they're great. They tell us exactly what the problem is. Oh, database connection not available, uh, syntax error, right? Whatever it is, that, that's it. Then we're, we're mostly done. But finding that log message, again, is the challenge, and that's where traces come in. Where is the problem occurring? And most importantly today, who is the domain expert that can actually help address this problem? Um, so, stepping out a little bit, uh, when I talk about observability today, I'm not talking about those three signals. If I say the word, I really just mean, can we understand what we're looking at? That's the goal. Can we look at something and understand why it's doing what it's doing? And, uh, with that in mind, it lets us answer questions like, what did the user experience? What was the latency of their experience? And uh, what error messages might they have seen, right? So, so we're starting from a digital experience, a user-centric point of view, and then tying that back to, okay, well, what did, what, what did I do? What did my team do? What do I have responsibility for that contributed to that experience? And what infrastructure might that be running on, right? And what else within the system could have contributed? So this is another case where having the complete understanding of what services call what can really come in valuable. So a common error that I've heard, I've heard multiple stories of people resolving what I call the bad neighbor scenario using distributed traces. So the bad neighbor scenario would be where you have a process running on a node that is doing something sneaky but bad, like con consuming resources in a way that doesn't immediately jump out at you and it's affecting your other services running on that node. You can't diagnose that type of problem without a complete understanding of your system typology. So that's why I really think distributed tracing is, is the killer app for observability, right? This is why the Open Telemetry project started with distributed tracing. It's because it lets us answer questions like, it lets us understand things like how the requests flow through our system. From that, we can create an entire topology of what our entire system looks like. And we can derive metrics from our traces, right? Like if a trace is uh, there for every single call within our system, we can get our RED metrics very easily from that. And we can enrich logs. We can make our log messages that are important very easy to find by attaching them to a trace. So that brings us to the Open Telemetry Project, which merged open tracing and open census beginning in 2019 and has been paving the way forward for open source observability as a universal format, right? And, uh, oh, darn, you can't see that either. Austin Parker's here. If you find him, he's got some really awesome pride stickers with the Open Telemetry logo. Definitely grab one. Uh, okay, so this is the state of Open Telemetry, right? Observability is not about signals, but Open Telemetry very much is. These are the three signals that are currently supported. And, and how far along they are in the, in the development life cycle, right? So tracing really is there. You can use it today in production. A lot of people are. It's awesome. Uh, metrics are coming along. Every time I show this slide, I have to update the metrics column because it's been uh, moving along very quickly. And logs is coming, right? Maybe we'll get to talk about that in a more interesting way next year. But it's more than just tools, right? The Open Telemetry Project, really at its heart, one of the most important things is the specifications that it provides. So that's things like the language APIs, how we inter actually interact with the telemetry signals. 
OTLP, right? This is the format that the telemetry signals actually get sent on over the network in. And trace context. This is a big one. This is how we actually propagate, right, the, the request IDs through our system so that we can under, so that we can have each service know what came before it and, and create the correct spans. Um, and then the semantic conventions, right? Naming things is one of the hardest things in software development. So semantic conventions are great. They give us a, a starting point for how we should name our things so that we can use them uh, interoperably and portably. We get the language SDKs. These, these are technically a specification also, but they're also the implementations that we're going to actually use within our programming languages and our services. We the instrumentation libraries that actually connect the uh, frameworks and libraries that we're using, the events in those libraries and uh, ORMs and so on, connect those to the actual open telemetry APIs and emit events. The open telemetry collector, which is the pipeline tool for gathering and, and exporting your telemetry data to your backend services. The Kubernetes operator, which of course is, is very useful for automatically creating and configuring the collector within a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it can also do some automatic instrumentation of your services, which is cool. And it's the community, right? It's the CNCF. Come talk to us in the Slack. Come participate. Come hang out in GitHub. It's events and meetups like this. And it's the end user working group and other special interest groups that you can join through the CNCF. Um, the end user working group in particular is great for real, real use cases and stories from actual people using actual open telemetry in production. Okay, so what does this actually look like? It's very simple, right? This is a very simple graph. We have our services, they send telemetry to the collector, the collector forwards it to the back end. If you're using a vendor, right, this might, you might replace the collector with like a vendor's proprietary agent, but generally this is what it looks like. So I'm not here to tell you what your job is. If you're dev or ops, I don't care, but you're gonna have really three parts that when you're setting up open telemetry that you're gonna need to touch, whoever it is on your teams that owns these things. You're gonna have some stuff in your code, you're gonna have some stuff on your node, and you're gonna have some stuff that you maintain right somewhere else. Maybe your platform engineering team takes care of that. Um, on your nodes with an asterisk, because you might not be running daemon set, right? Like you might be running a collector pool, but, but you kind of get the idea, right? It's a, it's a shared resource amongst the services. So these are the things that go in your code. These, this is what you run on your node. And importantly, right, that's where you're gonna get your infrastructure and start to tie together the user experience, the application level concerns with the infrastructure and ops concerns. And then finally, you're gonna export this all to a backend like a vendor or Jaeger, Prometheus, and Grafana are all open source and awesome. So making this a little bit more open telemetry specific, right, that graph we were just looking at. We have our services, we have the API, the SDK, and then within the collector, we have receivers, processors, and exporters. We'll look at those briefly in a moment. And then finally, we export our telemetry data to a place where we can actually do useful things with it and start to do some of that compare and contrast analysis debugging. Okay, so here's an example zooming in to the collector portion of that pipeline, right? This is, I love this example because it really shows what I was talking about, where you can actually extract your metrics directly from your trace spans and then get those into Prometheus. So this is just an example of one pipeline with receivers, processors, and exporters. There are actually other processors in the pipeline that I'm gonna show you later. Um, one of the most common ones, of course, is the batch processor. Um, there are samplers, there are um, filters, right? all kinds of things that you can do with processors. Um, but I just wanted to demonstrate that the processors don't have to operate on a single, on a single signal type, right? They can, they can be cross-cutting. Okay, so how did we get this? Well, I'm gonna show you now an example from uh, the Open Telemetry Demo Project. Um, so I'm, I apologize if you can't read this. It's, I wanted to show the whole thing on one slide because this is it. This is the whole implementation of open telemetry for one of the services within the open telemetry demo project. This is maybe two dozen lines of code, right? And most of it is just that, that array with the, the resource detectors duplicated. So let's talk about the first few lines of this real quick. So first we're just requiring, right, the, the open telemetry libraries. And then the auto instrumentation, right? So that's what takes the framework that we're using, in this case it's Next.js, and converts all of the incoming requests and outgoing calls 
into telemetry spans for us automatically so that we don't have to do any more manual instrumentation than just including this file in our program. And we're going to start to get some useful value out of that. And then we've got all these resource detectors. These are really cool. This is pretty new to the project. But this, this basically is going to just extract some information about things like processes, Docker containers, the host, and annotate your spans with that additional metadata. Um, one of the really cool things about traces, by the way, that I didn't mention earlier, is that you're not limited by the same cardinality that you are with metrics. So any kind of metadata that you think is useful to attach to a span, go ahead and do it. It's not gonna hurt. It's not gonna increase your Prometheus bill. Um, okay, so zooming in, a, oh, right, I did, I anticipated that would be hard to read. We can zoom in a little. So if, if that was hard to read, here it is. It's all on GitHub, right? You can find this on GitHub, it's great. Um, now, sometimes there are things that we wanna track that our framework might not know about. There are things that are interesting to us as a business that uh, just, right, it's part of our business logic, it's part of our application logic. The framework's not gonna be able to track it for us. In this case, it's a user ID, right? Again, unlimited cardinality. Throw your user session IDs in there. Um, other things that might be useful would be like a cart ID or a product ID. Um, this is the kind of metadata that can let us debug problems from the application and user perspective, right, in a way that we really can't when we're just talking about infrastructure. We can't talk about, oh, well, there's an error that occurs when you are specifically dealing with this version of this service and this specific product ID and the customer is from uh, Washington. Uh, so traces have all that metadata. Traces actually have that story built into their, their data structure. This is the, I guess, more ops side of this, right? This is how you configure the collector. It's just YAML. Again, this is on GitHub. Apologies for the slides. Um, oh, we can see this a little better. So I zoom out a little bit better, right? And you can see, so basically for each signal type in the collector, we're just defining a pipeline, and the pipeline is just those receivers, processors, and exporters that we saw in the, in the diagram earlier. Each one comes with a few configuration options. Uh, usually if it's an exporter, it's gonna be something like the endpoint and the additional headers that you need for um, authentication. So that's it. That's the whole thing. It's, it's really that easy. Like I, I can't stress this enough. Just like if you're not doing this already, not all of you raised your hands right at the beginning. Just go do this. <laughs> Implement it distributed tracing if you have a distributed system. You will immediately benefit from it. Um, and final, the final step, right, of course, is forwarding the data to the backends of your choice for storage and analysis. So we're going to look at that a little bit. Um, before we do, some common challenges and pitfalls. You're not going to fall victim to these because I've warned you. And you're also not going to be able to read them because the slides are cut off, so I'll have to read them to you. But, um, so the first is duplicate or excess data, right? This is especially common if you're using open telemetry in conjunction with a vendor um, or in conjunction with other open source tools. Be very careful that you're not duplicating any data um, as it can actually confuse the backends and confuse your engineers when you're trying to debug. So you want to make sure that you're only emitting one span for every interesting thing and that every service is only interest, instrumented with one technology, whether it's open telemetry or something else. Another challenge that I hear a lot is incomplete or missing data, right? Traces are only useful when they're complete. If you have a trace that is incomplete because the workload hopped over a, a message queue or, or a database that was untracked, right? Um, you're gonna lose the context of that request scope, all the work that, right, that happened for that request, and uh, you're gonna run into roadblocks and your MTTR will start going back up. Uh, changing in differing specifications. This is a problem with anything, but especially in open source, right? The community tries its best to not make breaking changes, but occasionally we learn things that require us to make breaking changes, and then you need to adapt to that and, and update. Um, and then also, it's a big community, right? Open Telemetry supports, I believe, 11 programming languages. So there's, there's going to be some, inevitably some differences in how those things get implemented, um, despite the specifications, and you're gonna have to deal with that. And then another one is the correlation of siloed signals. So it's great, right? I'm gonna show you an example with Prometheus and Grafana, and Jaeger, Jaeger and Grafana, sorry, as the visualization tools. Um, 
be really, really cool if I could tie those things together, right? And like that's just not something that's there with open source yet, but I hope that it will be. I, I think that would be awesome. And the last challenge that people have that I hear about is a lack of actual examples and best practices, but the community has your back there. So this is where my demo code came from, the OpenTelemetry demo project. Uh, go check it out, contribute, run it, um, copy it, copy, right, copy the examples. There's manual instrumentation examples for every single programming language supported by OpenTelemetry, except Swift, for obvious reasons. Um, the project uses gRPC for inter-service -commu communication and also for sending telemetry. And each service uh, shows examples of, of manual instrumentation, manual span annotation. The project uses Redis, Postgres, and Kafka, so you can look at tracing examples across all of those uh, downstream services. And it even shows an example of front-end tracing, which is kind of experimental right now. And uh, this is what the, the front end of the store looks like. Um, that's, that's really all I have for you today. So, um, oh, no, that's not. Here we go. One example of a, a Jaeger span, right, from the Open Telemetry Project. And we can see we have these custom attributes. How did those get there? Right, it's this easy. You take your span, you get it from the context. Okay, context. That's an, this is um, implemented differently in every programming language. So how you actually access this variable is going to depend on the programming language that you're working in. It maybe gets passed to your request handlers. Maybe it's a global variable like in JavaScript. Uh, but you get to grab the context thing, and basically it just has a parent ID that says this is the or trace ID that says this is the trace. That, or the span that my spans are children of. And then you can add whatever metadata you want. Um, so why do I love open telemetry? Because uh, of the open source instrumentation. Because you get portable and vendor neutral telemetry formats. You can benefit from the experiences of others, right? With auto instrumentation, people have already thought about what are the interesting paths that we need to, to instrument and emit spans for. And you get all of that wisdom just by including the library. And then finally, we get these interoperable tool chains, right? Like maybe one day someone will build the open source tool that lets me visualize my traces and metrics all in one place. Wouldn't that be awesome? Open telemetry makes it possible. Okay, that is really all I have for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.